overview of one of the key trajectories through this immensely complex field. There are many others that could do maybe better, but this is one I can offer. And you'll have it videotaped. If you want, I can send you the PowerPoint as an attachment, so you don't need to take notes. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. For sure, and put your seatbelts on. First one, Big Bang discovered. Took 10 years of data to actually make that true, but we can say it was discovered. And just to remember, the background from making Big Bang possible is this astonishing break Einstein had with the entire history of physics and cosmology. For, since Aristotle and Plato and all those folks, the universe was a receptacle. It was just there and it held matter. Um, and matter did what it wanted to do, like the water in my coffee. It's the shape of the water is the boundary of the coffee cup. Einstein said no, that space-time participates with matter in evolving the universe into its future. So they're in a dialectic relation, and it's a profound new concept. It goes back to Leibniz and the notion of geometry as relations. He represented by his equations in general relativity. On the left is the rep representation of the curvature of space-time. On the right, the distribution of matter, and they're put into an equation so they influence each other. So the Earth orbits the sun not because of a force of gravity making the Earth move in an ellipse in a three-dimensional space, but the Earth moves along a trajectory in space-time called a geodesic, the shortest distance between two points. Here's that wonderful image of the heavy egg on the elastic surface that distorts the egg, and all the little ants then crawl on ellipses around it. Matter tells space how to curve, Space tells matter how to move. That's a profoundly new concept of nature. And we'll see its impact on two discoveries. One, the beginning of the universe, and two, that the universe is capable of life. So let's just remember that in Einstein's early models, there were three models of the universe that obey those equations. One was the open three saddle, the open three flat, and the open in the closed three sphere. They have different futures, but the same past. They all seem to come from t equals zero, the beginning of time, beginning of the universe. Um, famously, John Archibald Wheeler called this the greatest paradox in the books of physics. How can the universe have a beginning point in time? And we'll look at that in some detail. So first, let me categorize three responses to the question of t equals zero in theology and science. Three ways people have talked about t equals zero. One, it's directly relevant. It's a really big deal, okay? And I'm gonna go back to Augustine's writings, of course, very appropriate for the occasion here, and to think, of course, of the Confessions, Book 11, and it's an el elsewhere. And Augustine asserts, of course, in his doctrine of creation, out of his doctrine of God, that God is transcendent beyond space and time. There's no way in which God is part of the universe. If that's the case, then God has to transcend time. But time is here, so it was created. And the notion of time being created, again, goes against what Plato and Aristotle would ever have thought of. So this is profound in itself. God gave the universe a beginning of time. Um, and that is, of course, encompassed in the famous classical doctrine of Cratio ex nihil, the creation of all things out of nothing, meaning no previous matter, no previous forms, or mathematical entities. And again, it's a striking departure from Greek thought. There's a wonderful quote I found from William uh, Hernandez um, in Houston, Texas. Time is a creature of God. He's talking about time as objective. He's also, also talked about time as subjective, but this is the objective side. Time is a creature of God. First, time is not eternal, meaning the past. The past is not eternal. Um, second, time is objective in the sense that time does not depend upon human consciousness. It was there before humans were there. We were created in the sixth day. Third, time is related, but not completely identical to the motions of the heavenly bodies. Now that's a notion he gets from Plato. But interestingly, there's a kind of previsioning of what Einstein would later on independently, obviously, take on board and produce general relativity. So, it's not eternal, it turns out to be a result of Big Bang cosmology, a prediction that there was a beginning at t equals zero, but it's a connection. That time is objective in the sense that time does not depend upon human consciousness, it's assumed in physics. It never occurred to me to think that um, time and physics somehow was bound up with consciousness. I was aware of, of time, but time isn't aware of me. 
Uh, but that's actually very profound. In fact, there's a real challenge there. If you really separate objective and subjective time, you get into a kind of two worlds view. And that'd be, a, that'd be a great place for a conversation after the presentation. I've done a lot of writing on whether or not that has be, been a kind of albatross for physics. But we'll get back to it. Third, and this is the nicest, this is according to um, Bill Hernandez, time is related but not completely identical to the motions of the heavenly objects. That's really prescient because that's exactly what Einstein says in his equations, that space-time, you've merged three space with time because of special relativity, and the motion of the heavenly bodies, right, the sun and the stars, become related together. And again, Einstein was the first to produce a scientific cosmology out of that thought. But there are some hints at that in Augustine. I think that's really, really quite astonishing and to be celebrated, right? Now, what you do with that is a huge problem for historical, philosophical, systematic theology. But it's still a clear kind of renaissance or resonance with these two incredible thinkers. And I want to celebrate that um, at the beginning of this lecture. Now, interestingly, there are other folks who think it's relevant, who have a very strong opinion about whether that's a good thing <laughs> or not. So for Pope Pius XII, as you all know, in 1951, he issued a statement in which he basically said, look, um, this is really wonderful. Science is now providing kind of evidence, or at least support, for what we Christians believe about the universe. Now, he was criticized by scientists for that, uh, including some Catholic scientists, who said, you're going to stir up the atheists because you know th there are a lot of incredibly good atheist cosmologists. We'll come right back to that. Hugh Ross, who is a very conservative Christian, has a, an organization called Reasons to Believe. My center at Seton Nets has 300 members. His center has 10,000. Right? And he came to faith not because of a Christian training or the Bible or you know summer camp. He came to faith because of Big Bang cosmology. He will say publicly, I'm a Christian because of Big Bang cosmology. So that's taking t equals zero <laughs> and putting it right square center of the, the table, right? That's, that's it. If t equals zero is somehow gone tomorrow, which it actually is, then what do you do with that? And I've talked to you about it. I've said to you, it's fine to say it represents and bodies. It, it helps you lead to your faith. But if you really face, put your faith on science, I think you've gone way too far, um, and, and yet he's, he'll still do that. So another good point of conversation. How much can you have it is interaction with science and yet not you know, make the one side lose its foundations and its authentic foundations, which for us, of course, is Bible tradition, but covenants, councils, and reason. But back to the other side. Um, Fred Horrell was a distinguished cosmologist in the 20th century and an outspoken atheist. Um, he, he was a little like Stephen Hawking or folks like that, Richard Dawkins. He, he really, really did attack faith. And, and I, you know, I can't blame the man. He was a major contributor to Big Bang cosmology. In fact, he was the one who coined the term Big Bang. Okay, I mean, so he had a vested interest in his cosmology and he, uh, he was a profound contributor to it. Um, and so when the Pope sort of said, look, this is proving our, us folk over here, he said, hell of it. <laughs> Sorry, it's on tape. But let me tip my hat in uh, astonishment and admiration for Fred Hoyle. In order to pr pr produce a competing cosmology, which he did, he had to actually reconstruct a theory of gravity that's relativistically correct, but not Einstein's theory. Because after all, Einstein's theory has a t equals zero. So you can't use that and get a competing theory with no beginning. So he actually produced a competing relativistically correct theory of gravity called Seafield cosmology. And out of that, he found a solution in which the universe has been expanding exponentially forever. So I think it's phenomenal. In fact, in some ways, he'd be a hero to the field of theology and science because he says in his own action that if you really have, uh, if you're really firmly committed to your theological and philosophical beliefs, and if you really are good at science, you might find a way to connect them not to prove science or to prove theology, but there might be fertile grounds for a conversation. I mean, we know the famous debates between Bohr and Einstein that were highly philosophical and that drove the two in different directions. So why not just say it? 
there, the, you have different fields. I've got a PhD in physics, not theology. But internal to physics are theological and philosophical assumptions. The image I give is my relation to my wife. We've been married 50 years this Christmas. I couldn't live without her. I can't imagine who I would have been without her. But we're, we're married. My daughter carries my genes. We have a different relation than I have to my wife. And it, that, I'm trying to suggest that theology and science have some internal relations that are there whether we want to admit or not. And sometimes it's not, it's not for the best, but they are there. And for someone like Hoyle, he was able to show that his firmly held theological, namely atheistic convictions, led him and motivated him to produce a competing theory of, of cosmology, which was good for 20 years. Right? So that's, that to me is astonishing. So my hats off to Fred Hoyle. Okay, category number two. If this is directly relevant, here's a completely year old aside. We don't care at all. This whole thing is nonsense. Get a, get a life, go get a sandwich, do something else. What, for these folks, what counts is not a beginning of the universe. Who really cares? What counts is the dynamic and open character of the universe, namely that the universe is biophilic, to use a common term now. The universe is one of which biological life can evolve, right, and can produce sentient creatures and even creatures capable of self-consciousness uh, and moral persuasion. And for Christians and Jews and Muslims capable of coming into covenant with God. That's astonishing. That's really astonishing. Right? Now, what's interesting about this is this position, which says, don't fixate on t equals zero. You'll miss the big picture. Right? You'll miss the universe we live in, are two of the pioneers of theology and science. So I think it's a really humorous situation because Arthur Peacock and John Polkinghorne were two of the most, well, John still is, two of the most distinguished uh, contributors. In fact, the, the big three are Ian, John, and Arthur, and, and, and two are gone. So this is important to note, that two of the pioneers in finding uh, links and creating bridges in finding interactions between theology and science didn't think there was one about t equals zero. So the takeaway from this is these are all really interesting approaches to something like t equals zero. It's got to be important in some way. It's the beginning of the universe. And yet it could be irrelevant for a lot of reasons. Well, there's always someone like me who takes a middle position. <laughs> Indirectly relevant, what a classy way to say it. But it really is, I think, the position most Christian theologians take. Science provides confirmation, but not proof. Or science can provide confirmation. Um, science and theology are consonant. A term I got from Erna McMullen, uh, early paper in 1980, Baptist paper on cosmology. How should they relate to consonants? Um, so Erna, Ian, myself, Ted Peters, my colleague at the GTU, Francis Collins, all these folks will talk about consonants some sort of relation that's indirect but important, right? So it's, it's um, my relation to my second cousin, not to my daughter. It's a relation, but not that direct. Okay, topic two, Big Bang and the, quote, anthropic principle. So whether or not the universe had a beginning, it's got certain characteristics. It's a four-dimensional space-time. It's not five, not three, not 4.6. It's got certain fundamental constants, like the speed of light, um, Planck's constant tells you where the quantum domain ends and classical domain begins. These are numbers which are characteristic of this universe as such, whether or not it had a t equals zero. Right? It's kind of like your identity, right? Even though you've grown and you're growing older, all that stuff changing. But there's something about you that's the same. This is like the constants of nature for, for the universe from a physicist's point of view, and that's what I am. Now, the question is this. Why are they fine-tuned for life? And just to illustrate that, if you think of the constants as C1 and C2, and they're actually five, so it's a five-dimensional hypercube, um, you can plot the value of the constant and the spread in that value that's consistent with life depending upon that value. Okay? And it turns out that variations of not just one part per thousand, but even one part per million in the values of those constants would characterize the universe that's not compatible with life. Right? It would not be a universe in which life could evolve. It'd be a physical universe, but it wouldn't be one in which life could evolve by evolutionary means. So then you plot these constants as five, so you've got a five-dimensional hypercube of a little space, hyperspace, in which our universe has to sit. 
our, uni the, our universe has to have the values inside that hypercube in order for it to be an anthropic universe. Now, this is just science so far. The question is, why is that and what does it mean? Well, why it is is because it is. I mean, what, what, <laughs> what does it mean? Well, there are two types of answers. Yes? Um, so that is like a statistic, right, that the universe would be in that little region yes. that would have to satisfy? Right. And that's the, you're referencing the For current scientific that it's just prob probability of like life being sustainable? Right. I'm going to keep going, but you're right. For the universe to have life, it has to be in a little box. And a little box is a five-dimensional box, and it's really tiny. It's one millionth per, per unit on each side. So it's really small. It's 10 to the 6 times 5 is 30. So why is it there? Because we're obviously there. We're here. Hello? OK, we're here. OK. Well, of course, one answer that I like to give is God. God, being clever, chose to create the universe such that life would arise on lots of planets and presumably many, maybe even intelligent life and life with moral values. But we're here. And that's what it's trying to explain. So this sort of fleshes out the doctrine of creation. God didn't just create a universe with a beginning. God created a universe in which, through natural means, and not constant intervention, we'll get to ID, intelligent design later, and reject it. But through natural means, namely Darwinian evolution, life would arise and evolve to create creatures capable of, of agape love. Well, of course, the other answer, and it's a good answer, is that every possible universe exists. That's the one on the right. All possible universes exist. So of course something's in the, in, 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 within the box of conditions capable of life, right? Remember Rosanna, Rosanna, Dana, and Laffin, is this the party to whom I'm speaking? Right. Uh, you done it, of course it is. <laughs> By definition, you're speaking to her. Um, the universe needs to be such that it is. Well, it is because some universe is there. Now I just want to pause and just for a second do a little hermeneutical dissect on this question. I, I pose it as a theological response and a scientific response to a common question. A question just based on kind of facts, right? This is just the situation. Well, God is clearly a theological, I mean, you could do it using Spinoza or something, but it's clearly a theological assumption in the, in the literature. They mean the God of monotheism. But what about the right side? Is that a strictly scientific response? Well, one clue is that when it first came out in the 1980s, the most of the folks who were doing many worlds were atheists. And it's not surprising. I mean, once again, it's a kind of horror scenario again. I mean, they're fantastic scientists, and they don't want to keep working on a model which somehow valorizes theism. That's the point. But that isn't the real point. The real point is it's an interesting metaphysical claim. It involves the claim that <clears throat> every mathematically possible universe must exist. Now, you could say, it's a logical description of every possible universe, but you can't go from possible universe to actual universe. There's got to be a principle of actualization. I mean, that was Plato's God, right? That's creation next nihilo. So it's really a metaphysical or even a kind of implicit theological argument that something is the explanation for the universal existence of all possible universes. Doesn't mean that it isn't true. In fact, it's a very powerful argument. But it isn't a purely scientific argument. Or, if you want to take my version, it's one of those philosophical threads that runs in and through science and conditions science. And so it's legitimate because it's a philosophically motivated part of a scientific explanation. Just like <coughs> Bohr's notion of uh, action at a distance or strange action was a kind of philosophically motivated response to Einstein's rejection of quantum mechanics as complete. Now, that's interesting because then both sides, of course, critique each other on those grounds. The, the many worlds critique the explicitly theological one is, well, this isn't helping, this stops the scientific game. If you want to say God explains this, then we shouldn't search for any other kind of explanation. But that's putting, an that's putting an end to a scientific research question, why these constants the way they are. And it's an arbitrary end because it isn't part of science. It's part of metaphysics. So you don't have the authority to do that. So we're going to keep on doing what we're doing. Thank you. And I think it's a legitimate answer, response. But you can do the same to the other side. You can say, well, why would you insist almost dogmatically, forgive me, <laughs> on arguing that every possible universe exists simply because you want to reject a much simpler, or at least in 
some metaphysically important sense, simpler explanation, namely, necessary being is the only explanation for contingent being. After all, all this is about contingent being. So you have to have a necessary explanation. Otherwise, you just push, push the puck down further. So the point I'm getting at is it, it shows how this kind of research is really fascinating because both sides need each other to clarify the problem and interact and, in fact, have pieces of each other's problem solutions in their, in their problematic. So it's a highly con, uh, convoluted and, I think, fascinating discussion. It still goes on. Now, just to finish the second question, I take the, I take the, the implications this way. I don't think either side should use the fine-tuning as a, inherently a design argument for God. Um, faith in God is not based on science, though theology may be partially confirmed by science. So for the people on the anthropic side, that's the left side, um, they're basically saying this is a design argument. God designed the universe this way. God said that's the best explanation for fine-tuning, but it's a design explanation, or at least it's usually couched as a design explanation. And I think we learned our lesson from evolution that those lead to a tangle, although they're, they're important. Some pursue it, that's fine. But what I do want to point out is a recap to the first question about t equals zero. That is, there's something else missing in this issue. And that is the actual splendor of the universe in which life exists. And to overfocus on whether or not it's a design argument can uh, turn us away from asking what's significant about the fact that life exists and life exists the way it does. So I take this cue from Freeman Dyson and Paul Davies. They're, bo they're both friends. Dave, Paul and I are very good friends. I, both of them are sort of deistic Christians, maybe, maybe they're not really clear. But they push this idea hard against Weinberg, Dawkins, and Monod, Right? The voices that usually conservative Christians respond to, they responded to in this way by saying, you know what, we're really at home in this universe. This universe feels right. right? When I was an undergraduate physics major at Stanford back in the days of the dinosaurs a long time ago, okay, you know, no one thought there was any meaning to the value of the speed of light. You had to memorize it to get a degree. But who cares? It could have been one meter per second faster. Why would it matter? No one thought there was anything significant about biology and evolution and physics. Physics is physics, and biology does what it does. But as Paul Davis will say, and it's a little bit tongue in cheek, John Barrow will say this too, biology sets constraints on physics. Meaning, if you've got biological phenomena, you've got a radically constrained physics that you didn't know you had before. That's really fascinating. But after all, psychological, somatic creatures are biological. That means if you have creatures that think and feel and care and hate, tragically, that puts constraints on biology and physics. So finally you get a kind of top-down spectrum of constraints that say, we really are kind of astonishing creatures. I'm not being homocentric. I'm just saying self-conscious life, wherever it occurs, okay, Earth's one place. You know, maybe Alpha Centauri is someplace else. I think I, there is life that's conscious and written a lot on it. But that puts really unique constraints on the kind of universe we're in. And as to its notion of specialness and intentionality, so at least as a Christian, I can really say this helps me evolve out a really complex and beautiful doctrine of creation that um, includes all we've said so far, but brings the splendor of creation, even in the physics of it, into purview. And one more thing. This is the third question coming up next. One of those constants is Planck's constant. Now that's a physics constant. It gives you quantum mechanics and so on. But we're going to see that it's also essential to the evolution of life. So there's another link between this particular fine-tuning aspect, namely Planck's constant, and the evolution of life through neo-Darwinian evolution. So, <clears throat> so far, physics and a cosmology with fine-tuning make the biological evolution of life in the universe. Next, neo-Darwinian biology and creation theology. So, just scan down the list of key concepts in evolutionary biology. Here's this wonderful um, shrub of life, not tree of life. And I, I love how you see where animals were one of those, right? Right next to the slime molds and the fungi. <laughs> That'll really help trim yourself and keep 
uh, help me keep aware of who I am and who I'm not. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay. So, how do you relate that to Christian theology? Or to even theism more widely conceived? Well, of course, one camp sees a conflict. Richard Dawkins sees evolution as a reason for atheism. And my response is he's confusing science with scientism. Right? He's taking evolution as a theory that works in a wonderfully defined field, biology, and making it a worldview. And whenever you do that, it, you apply the nothing but argument. You're making a metaphysics out of physics. We did it with Newton, and the watchmaker, let's not do it again. Scientific creation, six day account. <clears throat> My response, Genesis does not teach us science. Or to quote our beloved Augustine, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. It's not a cookbook, it's not a recipe, it's not a scientific theory, so that's over. Intelligent design, put God into Darwinism. Now, this is really subtle. Well, not too subtle, but it's more subtle. Um, the basic argument is that science, science as it stands is inadequate, not wrong, and not atheistic. It's inadequate to capture the full complexity of biological creature, biological evolution. So you need to add a new explanatory factor along with selection and variation. And that's going to be an intelligent agent. That's code for God because they want to teach in a public high school and you can't talk about God in high school. So it's a strategy to avoid litigation. But why is it wrong? It's wrong because science is basically, again, a complicated argument, based on methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism says, basically, try to explain every effect you know about in terms of a natural cause. It doesn't say there are no divine causes, right? With a two-inch fish net, you can't tell whether they're one-inch fish. But you can say there are no three-inch fish. So you explain, you know, why I have cancer by natural means. I mean, that's the explanation. So why is that a problem? Well, because ID folk want to argue that if you are committed to methodological naturalism, which I am, you're going to slide right immediately into metaphysical naturalism, which I'm not. <laughs> There's no necessary move. So as long as one is careful of not saying, right, because I can explain how life got here to a certain extent with natural means, I have no, nothing else to say about it. As long as you don't do that, you're fine. What about the other one, instead of conflict independence? So this is Stephen Day, Jay Gould's NOMA, non-overlapping, non Magisteria. Keep science and religion separate. No conflict. Well, that's true. Except it's that if that was were actually true, if that were actually capable of being true, we wouldn't have had Immanuel Kant. We wouldn't have the Enlightenment. We wouldn't have modern philosophy. There's no way to, to you can in practice, in pragmatic style, you can keep them separate. I can go to a physics class and not think about evolution. But ultimately they overlap. It's just one universe, one set of laws. So you really can't achieve what Gould achieved. Gould gives us a practical, working, everyday tool to avoid conflict, and it's always good to avoid conflict, right? Sometimes if you're in a messy family, maybe divorce is the best thing. You know, it's tragic, but maybe that's the best thing. But it's not the point. It's not what you want. It's not a, a living standard of what the best way to relate is. I mean, you see the point. So what else do we have? We have theistic evolution, um, creation and evolution. Integrate biological evolution into Christian theology as what Ian Barber called a theology of nature, or we would call it as systematic theology a lot of science. Just take it on in and rethink everything. An ideal example is Wolfhard Pannenberg. We're teaching Pannenberg in Moulton and adopt a course this summer, this spring, at the GQ, and it's amazing how well he's done this, how well he's taken science seriously into his systematics and allowed it to help reframe his systematics from the ground up. But what's nice about Theistic evolution is like, a, it's like a rainbow of positions. It's not just one position, as ID is. So look at the spread of people who would consider themselves a th theistic evolutionist. Read the list. And here's two great quotes. Here's Arthur Peacock, 79, 40 years ago. He, he sort of defined the field. That's an amazing. Uh, claim, God acts <coughs> through chance and law. He called that continuous creation. God created the universe ex nihilo 
to have exactly this combination of chance and law that makes continuous creation of time possible. Isn't that beautiful? In one sentence, God acts ex nihilo to make a universe in which God can act continuously. You know, what kind of banner for that whole style? <clears throat> Karl Rahner, um, 13 years earlier in his um, <clears throat> Christology and Evolutionary Worldview. Manity bec matter becomes spirit through active self transcendence. Matter becomes spirit through active self transcendence. It's dualistic in a sense, but it isn't really. It's really a profoundly integrated view of the human person. Christ, <clears throat> the final and normative manifestation of God in the beginning of the divinization of the world, an incarnation possibly fits into an evolutionary worldview. He went back to Duns Scotus, and he retrieved that ancient wisdom that Christ would have come, in the, there would have been incarnation even if there hadn't been a, quote, fall. Christ's mission isn't um, satisfactorily couched in a saving act of rescuing us from our misery, <laughs> although it, it does that. But Christ would have been incarnate, the second person would have been incarnate in any universe in which this matter self-articulating into spirit. So it's a, it's a beautiful way of saying I can give you, I can embrace evolution as the historical narrative of the matter-spirit uh, journey. And I don't need to worry about the fact that for evolution there's no fall because I'm not depending on my Christology. That's an incredible frame. And so here we have a leading um, Anglican theologian, a leading Roman Catholic theologian, both embracing uh, evolution. Very different ways, right? Arthur would never take on the matter-spirit language. Um, and I don't think um, Karl Rahner would have, <coughs> would have um, taken the kind of non-metaphysical approach to uh, the science and, and theology that Arthur does. So they're very different. Uh, but they're both agreeing that evolution and Christian theology go together. Well, what about divine intervention? Does this mean that God doesn't act in nature? This is a hard problem, and it'll take a little more to spell it out, but I think we can get there. How do you think of divine action? Of course, God acts in everything. God creates everything, ex nihilo, giving it existence. God continuously acts through everything, giving it its future. But does God ever make a counterfactual action? Does God ever make a difference in the narrative of nature? Does petitioner prayer ever get answered? Now, you can frame it in terms of miracles. I don't want to do that. It's too narrow. I, I believe in miracles. I affirm them. But I want to see God acting throughout nature. And I don't want to see every act of God as miraculous. But I also don't want to see it all as just um, God supporting what nature does. Um, it's, I'm, I, the quest is to see a way of talking about God actually working with nature in and through nature to make a difference without violating or intervening the laws of nature. So it's a, it's a libertarian or non-compatibilist view of divine natural interaction. It may not be everyone's boat. Um, it, 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 it's a chancy, hard act of pursue, but it's interesting. Let's just look at it for a second. If God, if the world is deterministic, like we thought it was with Newton, if everything is governed by a deterministic law, which says nature causes nature, period, that the future evolves from the past deterministically, then you're into a forced option for divine action. What the conservatives take is affirmation of objective intervention. Every act becomes a miracle because you don't want to lose the category of miracle when it comes to the New Testament. So you project all the way back. And when it goes to, to evolution, you've got a problem because you're not going to say every single mutation is an evolution. It's a, it's a miracle. I mean, it doesn't work. So that's a problem. What everyone since Schleiermacher in the liberal part of the camp has taken is the subjective view. Well, you know, as he says in, in the speeches, religion, sorry, miracle is a religious term for an ordinary event. So I took my kids, my wife and mom, to see an eclipse, solar eclipse in the Pacific in 79, and it was spectacular. You know, and it came right in the middle of the day, and we're all on the deck, well, our telescopes were all crying and yelling and praising. It's, it's an astonishing event. It's, it's a miracle, right? But it's not a miracle in the literal sense. In fact, it's precisely not a miracle. It's precisely a deterministic event with just the right si visual sizes of two objects that cross just the right way. 
it weren't for the exact deterministic laws of, of gravity, you'd never get it. So it's not a miracle in any sense. There's no violation of anything, and yet it feels like a totally unique event, and it was. I remember the day right now. Right? That's a, that's a liberal Schleiermacher ritual, you know, tillich way of saying miracle. Now, both work. I mean, tons of people, you know, go with both communities. I'm not in any way saying this is a problem, but th it is a forced option. It really has limitations on both sides. Does does God act? to respond to petitionary prayer? Does God act in evolution? Or is Dawkins right and evolution is permission for atheism? So my point is, well, maybe we're not stuck in the framework that got us here. Right? When I get really stuck in a problem, I ask, who set the boundary conditions? Who's the authority saying who are you, with the box you've got to stay in so we can get out of the box? What we need is an outer non-interventionist objective divine action. It combines the advantages of both parts of the option. And it was one of the goals, or a dozen goals, of the two decades long series of con uh, conferences and publications by the Vatican Observatory and CTNS in the 90s and 2000s. So here's a way of diagramming it. Here's a diagram of types of divine action, DA. If we really did live in a deterministic world, which we thought we did with Newton, you can have a subjective view or an objective view of divine action. The subjective view is non-interventionist. That's the liberal view, Hank Schleiermacher. The objective view is conservative, right? And that's the miraculous view. That's the split. Those are the options. Now, just for a moment, notice this is a split within the church community. But it's a split not about how many sacraments there are or how to read John. It's a split over a philosophy of nature. It's an ex external discipline. And it's a voice on that discipline coming into us and saying, you got to choose. Right? It's a deterministic view of nature. You don't get it from reading Deuteronomy. Right? You don't get it from science. You get it as an interpretation of science. But once that's the worldview, it has ripples outside of its philosophical boundary, and it affects the life and, and prayer life of the Christian church in profound ways. It, there's a lot at stake besides this kind of theology and science game we're playing. But if you live in an indeterministic world, if you live in a world where, of course, there's natural causality, obvious, but maybe it's insufficient in every event to determine the future. Maybe natural causality isn't enough. Then. You have the same subjective or objective interpretations of divine action, but now there's a, there's a second objective interpretation, non-interventionist. So the possibility for a phil philosophical interpretation of divine action in terms of non-interventionism is based on the philosophical view of nature as indeterministic. That's the game. Here are six approaches to it. This is a summary of the approaches in that series. So Thomistic philosophy basically rejects it. Michael Dodds recently wrote a book called Unlocking Divine Action where he rejects the question and says, You're, you have to be a compatibilist about divine action. Otherwise, you put God, you make God into a secondary cause. It's a very subtle argument. I think he's wrong. We've talked about it for a long time. But basically, it's a, it's a very well-known position in, in Thomistic circles that you've got primary and secondary causality, that's it. And so God acts as a primary cause in every secondary cause, but never changes the outcome, to put it kind of crudely. Process philosophy accepts it. The, the God of process philosophy would say, sure, in every single event in nature, they call those actual occasions, God provides a lure towards the best possible future kind of like a conscience in a way, like a beautiful, loving conscience saying, this is the way you should act, Bob. This is the way you shouldn't act. We, we all experience that. So there's a sense in which God is acting in everything as a contributor to what I do, right? but not determining it. Um, third, whole part causality. Arthur was so concerned to avoid any sense of God tinkering in nature, that any sense in which an type of an action would be here and not there that he said, well, the only place for God to, to ex exert it is on the whole of the universe. So if I froze this cup with this water, 
I'd have a cone of water. I have a cone of water not because God manipulated the individual molecules or changed the laws of water, but because God set the boundary conditions. God, God would be like the container. The problem with this approach is that the universe doesn't have a container. Every, every system in the universe is part of a bigger system. But the system of the universe isn't a, isn't a part of a bigger system, both by definition and because the universe is a four-dimensional manifold. It's not a three-dimensional volume inside a four-dimensional manifold. It's the universe is the universe, right? So that doesn't work. Top-down causality. This was um, one that Nancy Murphy and Phil Clayton are, are still championing. I think it's a very, very helpful approach unless you are a Churchland and believe that mind is just a function of the brain, right? For Churchland, mind is the brain as a digestion is the stomach. Okay, if you believe that, who is the you that believes it? But in any case, it, 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 there must be some sort of bottom-up causality, but some sort of top-down as well. If there is some top-down causality, if you have mind because of brain, but mind influences brain, I choose to wave my hand, right? Then there's, that might be a model for divine action that doesn't violate natural law. I don't violate my own physiology by waving my hand. I fulfill it, right? So it's not compatibilist, obviously, but it's not interventionist. That's a pretty good glimmer of a beginning for a, an other type of argument. I think Nancy and Phil and others are doing great work on this. Then there's chaos theory. John Folkenhorn, where chaotic systems look unpredictable, but they, but, I mean, look, they are deterministic, but they look unpredictable. I think in the end this doesn't work, but that's a, it's a helpful approach. And then bottom-up causality, um, quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, good news, Quantum mechanics can be interpreted in terms of ontological determinism. Quantum mechanics can be extended to support theistic evolution. Quantum mechanics underlies key evolutionary processes such as genetic mutation, which are essential to neo-Darwinian evolution. So it gives you a robust theistic evolution. God does act in general processes of nature, you can call it general providence. God really does act in special events, you can call it special providence. What science discovers as chance and evolution can be interpreted in terms of ontological interpretation. These events are the results of God's special action. So evolution is how God creates a diversity of living things without intervening. What does it give you? God really does act in evolution, Pache, Richard Dawkins. God's special action is hidden from science. Science only discovers chance events. No need for an interventionist theology of divine action attempting to introduce a divine agent along with variation selection, so ID, you're out. And Monod is finally defeated. Precisely what he claims as the blindness of evolution, which precludes God's action, is in fact the result of God's action. Okay. Well, fourth topic. We have to go quickly now because time is almost up. Biology, suffering, disease, death, extinction, are constitutive of life. Physics, asteroid impact, tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, help not make life possible. And if you want, afterwards, you can ask me what this little wasp does. That's so nasty. How do you explain it? Well, two basic accounts. All is created good by God. The fall, suffering, and, evil, and death are, for humankind are a consequence of the fall. Leads to suffering and death in nature. Evolutionary account. Natural evil are constitutive of life. Part of the biological process that vastly preceded the human species. You gotta choose. I mean, you can mix and match a little bit, but those are pretty stark differences. Yeah, big deal, okay. Um, here's a wonderful comment from Marilyn McCord Adams who recently died last year of, con of cancer. If God creates the diversity of life on earth through the process of nature, what is God's relation to such extensive, she called it horrific, suffering in nature? Well, just super quick, three categories of response. They all turn to the cross and resurrection. You can't solve the suffering of nature within the doctrine of creation. You, you wind up as one said with a crucified God, a God against God. So you have to go to what Christians go to. We're a salvation religion, right? So you go to cross and resurrection. One option, God suffers with all creatures, usually turn, um, you develop in terms of, of kenosis, self emptying of Christ. Barber, Polking, and a Peacock take this route. Second one, God redeems the world. One form is objective and subjective immortality. That's Barber using Whitehead, of course. The Visio Dei, Dante's Paradise, 
glorious ending, right? But they're only souls, um, arguably, not material. That's peacock. Or in eschatology of new creation, matter counts. Matter matters. Matter has a future. New creation. That's Polk and Russell. Now, that's, th that's fine, but how about science? The only one that has a challenge is the last one. The other, all the other ones are compatible with science. Science doesn't challenge it at all. Not really. But the last one sure does. And that's why I choose to follow that one, because I like a hard problem. OK, that takes us to the fifth question. From creation to new creation. The basic methodology is to say, the resurrection of Jesus is not resuscitation. That would be an ordinary miracle. Not immortal soul, but bodily resurrection. So it's not miracle or Gnostic, right? But bodily, what the Pharisees looked for. Resurrection of Jesus requires the general resurrection at the end of age. <coughs> the logic of Paul is <coughs> painfully clear. <coughs> if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. He can't be the first fruits of an event that's not going to come. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. That's pretty bare bones. Implication, God will transform the present creation into the new creation. OK. So I'm siding with <clears throat> Pannenberg against Boltmann and Tillich and um, obviously Slymacher and the whole team. So I'm siding with um, N.T. Wright against Jesus Seminar. But now comes the challenge. Save it for the end. Cosmology. <clears throat> All the, the, future, the future of the universe, according to physics, is one of three things. Sorry. Either it expands forever and freezes forever, either as a three saddle or three flat, or recollapses as a three sphere and goes back to T equals zero, intense heat and end of life. And in either case, the possibility for any kind of life, in fact, the possibility for atomic matter is over in about a trillion years. So you're only going to have quantum particles and photons running around. Neither of those futures talks about a new creation, obviously. It goes without saying. That's given. So what do you do? Well, you could say this is the end of theology and science, at least for me. You know, I've, I've pushed the argument from T equals zero to Big Bang future, and it's been good so far, you know, and I've had a nice career, but that's it. That's one option. I don't take that option. <laughs> or <clears throat> you simply recognize a very obvious fact. The challenge is not actually from science, but from a philosophical assumption we bring to science. Now, it's not surprising that I made this assumption all along because I was influenced by Hume and Boltmann and Dominic Cross and all the rest. Arnack, I mean, everybody made the same assumption that the future will be with science predicts. Or I've never seen a dead person rise, so they, they never will. It's the pr problem of induction. Well, I've never seen a, a black swan. doesn't mean there isn't one. You can't use induction in history and predict the future or rule out the future. But you have to be careful what that costs. So here's the second part of the immediate assumption. Let's assume the regularities of nature which science describes are ultimately due to the regular and faithful action of God as ongoing creature, creator. In other words, the regulars of nature that we describe in natural laws, the natural laws don't determine those regularities. It's not prescriptive. They describe the regularities. It's descriptive. The causality isn't in the platonically conceived ontologically real natural laws that govern nature. It can't violate the conservation of energy. That's a platonic rule. No, the laws of nature describe the causality inherent in nature, nature's own efficacy. Well, that at least gets the laws of nature out of your path and Hume is gone. That whole, that whole argument was a Humean argument. It's gone. Well, what's left? Well, you've got causal properties of nature. Well, are they only natural causes? Well, no, thanks to Augustine again, which I should put in this slide. Augustine's view was that everything happens by divine causality in nature. God is the transcendence God who is imminent in nature. God's transcendence is such that God can be imminent without not being God. Right? God's more in intimate to me than I am to myself. So it's in fact God acting in, with, and through nature, to use the Lutheran phrase, that is what we mean by natural causes. 
you can never take out the God and say, have the natural causes left. But you're never going to look at the natural causes and find God in it. Right? It's, it's, it, it's a true combination in which, and you can use Christological language for this, obviously, hypostatic union, in which God, God remains God, nature remains nature, and they work together to produce the future. What a glorious vision it is. And it's everywhere in all time. If God chooses to act in a new way, then the future will not be what science predicts. If every day you and I went to lunch and I had a chicken sandwich for 10 years, and we went to lunch tomorrow, and I had a turkey sandwich, you might say, Bob, why did you change your mind? But you wouldn't say, Bob, you violated the law of nature or, or you're acting crazy. You, just, you changed your mind. Why did you change your mind? Well, God changes <laughs> God's mind. God acts in a radically new way at Easter and allows nature to be a new nature, right, a new creation. If God acted in a new way at Easter and promises to continue to do so, then the freezer fry predictions will not happen. So it's not a conflict between cosmology and theology. It's a conflict between cosmology and enlightenment philosophy, which served as a basis for so much of Christian theology and still does for so much of biblical studies and, and <coughs> everyday theology. And that's what I'm saying can be set aside. So what's next? How do we continue the dialogue <coughs> between theology and science given the assumption about a new creation that arises out of the present creation and gives all material creatures eternal life? As Moltmann says, matter matters. If the, if the matter of this world isn't important for the new creation, we're in an ecologically disastrous Gnostic cosmology. Matter matters. This is perhaps the most challenging and crucial issue on the frontier of theology and science. So. Thank you. Mind-boggling, mind-blowing. <laughs> well. Robert, uh, are there questions that anyone would like to ask? All at once. Mm -hmm. Dr. Glenn. Dr. Glenn? Yes. Um, but also, when I read scripture, um, I find the same sort of mm -hmm. phenomena. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, for example, one example would be uh, Jesus says, My yoke is light, Jesus says, My yoke is heavy. <laughs> well, yeah. It has to be a, a picture that's complementary, right. not either or. Right. So, I'd be interested yeah. in, in no. just your ideas, yeah. how, it's how that yeah. relates to the, the things that you're talking about. No, oh, thank you, Dr. Lamb. I've thought about it a lot. I've used it a lot in my writings. Um, I've always been fascinated by commentary and by Bohr's arguments. Um, the challenge is that, at least as a physicist, you want to approach the world as a realist of some kind. You want to say, well, the properties you find are properties of something. They may be complementary properties, but what's the thing itself that holds those properties, right? And so, as a ph physician, I mean, you want to say mind and physiology are both functions or properties of the person. You look at me, you have to know a lot more than just my weight or my height to know if I'm healthy. So they're complementary properties of a, of a single person. The challenge in quantum mechanics, where that term comes from, as you're saying, is that we don't know what the person is behind the properties. We don't know what could be a wave and a particle at the same time. It's an ontological question. Or to put it in theological context, you know, I would affirm that Jesus is fully God and fully human, but I can't imagine how that could be. Now, that's fine. We can leave it at that and say, okay, that is truly a mystery, and that may be the way to see a lot of these, and that, I've, I've written a lot on that. But there's also the kind of quest to say, well, um, you don't want to stop the 
the, the conversation too soon. There might be more insights to come of it. And after all, that's why Einstein accepted that Bohr was right about quantum mechanics as we have it, that quantum mechanics on the textbook requires complementarity of properties. But maybe it's not a complete theory. And so from 35, 1935 onwards, he pursued a complete theory. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate struggle because he was a classic realist, right? He, he was a realist for sure. Whereas Heisenberg, I mean, Bohr, you know, was willing to say, I think we've learned that realism fails as an epistemic strategy at that point. We've discovered with complementarity that the realist program of properties or properties of things, not, not that that's over, but you can't ever tell what the things are, right? And that's a different way of playing the complementarity aspect. Um, and some folks even said, well, science and religion are complementary. So there's been a lot of conversation, so thank you. Good, good question, and I still think about that a lot. Other comments? Can we throw yeah. one more thing in? Well, yeah, please. Yeah. You, you, yeah. So I was just, um, you, could you get back to the quantum position where you use quantum theory to flip God in there? Because <laughs> it, it went a little, yeah. So can you explain that again, how you do that? Sure. I had to cut out, cut out a lot to make five yeah, copies. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Just key. Yeah, it is key. Thank you very much. So the argument is, <clears throat> you've got quantum mechanics. You have to choose an interpretation. Doesn't mean it's right. So I do it as a what if experiment. If this interpretation is right or at least helpful for the future, how would it inform a theological question? So the question is how does God act in nature to achieve a counter counterfactual purpose that's not just um, you know, Kantian? Okay. <clears throat> you, what you have to articulate carefully is that <clears throat> what brings about the quantum event which is usually called the collapse of the wave function, is a product of divine and natural causality together. And there's two ways that people think of it. One is God provides the occasion for the event to occur, sometimes called the triggering cause. The other one is God um, decides which of the multiple possibilities is actualized. Now, neither of those have a natural explanation within quantum mechanics understood through commentary. Um, so those are legitimate ways of talking about God without making God into a secondary cause. Unless you're a neo neotomist of su such that you say anything God does to supplement or participate in a natural process short of miracle is making God into a secondary cause. And my response is to them, you, Thomas has three kinds of miracles. The third kind is God does things which secondary causes could do, but God does them anyway. And obviously, it doesn't make Thomas into, uh, make God into a secondary cause. So I'm saying, just take the same argument and apply it to a non-miraculous situation. It's even more easy to think about. Well, I like that very much. I might use the word personal. Tillich talked about superpersonal, because, because if, if I say person, mm -hmm. it, it, can, it can easily become idolatry. Or but I know you don't mean that. I'm just saying, I've, I've been accused of that a lot, because I tend to use ontological versus personal like language. You, well, enough said. Um, yeah, I think one of the fruitful methods is to take some problem we think about in theology, like the the human person, or sorry, how, how a person acts in the world, and then use this as an analogy for how God acts in the world, but putting this big frame around saying God is not a person. God is at most personal or a trinity. Now, I find trinity language very fruitful for metaphors. So Beth Johnson, um, Ronder, I mean, there's a dozen wonderful theologians who give me rich metaphors from Trinitarian language for how God acts in the world. And of course, trinity is about God acting in the world. It's the economic trinity, which is the human trinity for Ronder. So that gives you really wonderful language. That really does sound like personal. And that's how Pannenberg does <coughs> his response to these questions. He'll talk about 
<coughs> the relation of first, second, and third persons, second being the son in the world, the first person being God is greater, and how that works out. So that, that, that's a way of talking about personal in terms of relations, not in terms of entities. Yeah. Oh, sorry, in the back, I think you had your hand. Go ahead. Please. I wonder if you could speculate a little bit on the new creation. You guess you have this tiny little cube where the Earth sits. Is the new creation going to be in the same place? And if it's the same place, is it really new? And if you move it, then you know, how's it going to exist? <laughs> good, good. You know, honestly, <clears throat> we're all brave to be here because these questions are like, you know, bowling where the two gutters <laughs> are, are really deep <laughs> and easy to fall into, right? Um, Moltmann, in his, his book on eschatology, says three things about the new creation and stops and says, I don't want to do science fiction. It goes on to something else. I mean, you know, only fools tread lightly on this. So trying to make a response is really challenging. But uh, it's a little bit like the resurrection. New Testament scholars who I follow, about 35 who do this bodily resurrection stuff, like Jerry O'Collins and N.T. Wright, <coughs> will say that it's a transformation, not a resuscitation, and not a solectomy, <laughs> right? So that it's the same person, Jesus of Nazareth, who's Christ the Lord. There's an element of continuity, but he never dies. You know, he can manifest himself in, 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 in dying. There's el that's the element of discontinuity. And the discontinuity outweighs the continuity. It's the opposite of evolution, where you assume physics saves and you get new biology. This is new everything with something of continuity. So how to flesh that out in terms of, well, where would the new space time be? It's like Arthur's mistake about boundary conditions applying to the universe as a whole. The question is misformed. It, we are in the new creation already in some way. Agape love is part of the new creation. The Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem is part of the new creation. There are really good things about this world, right? There really is. Suffering love is really here. There are really wretched things. Those will be gone. They simply won't be. They'll be forgotten and forgiven. Jeremiah 3131. But what's really good and beautiful will be there, but in multidimensional form. It, Pannenberg says, <clears throat> in the new creation, um, the difference between um, sacred and secular is overcome, but the difference between God and nature is, re remains. It's a framework for thinking about it. Now, how you th think about it in terms of space time is one or two levels down than anybody has thought of it very carefully, unless you, uh, I mean you, unless one forgets all the complexifications and, and has some rapture theory or something, which is going to help. But I'm convinced it's true. See, I think Paul was lucky in a way. Paul didn't have somebody saying to him, I can give you a knockdown, drag out reason why there won't be a general resurrection. If Paul had heard that argument and realized how profound it was, he might have said, well, in that case, we really are the worst of fools, because it's not, it's not the first fruits. And that's what I feel like I'm facing with eschatology and cosmology, one of those you know, all-determining losses. It isn't just, well, I should have been a Catholic. I mean, this is, it, it's over, game over. I, re I reject that as a Christian. So I've stayed with this question for 30 years. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, um, thank you for uh, a little simulating uh, quality and more than the theory of the process and uh, of my experience at least. Um, I have a question about the new creation that you end up with at the end. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, it was interesting. I was curious about the implications for the doctrine of God uh, in light of what Paul said about it. Um, I love your example about eating the honey sandwich and cookie sandwich. Uh, a doctrine of God 
concerned and worried about uh, something like the Holocaust. There's a conception of God that you all friends and family you should come forward with that. Um, if God doesn't need to be the guy, then God has to get God himself to us, or maybe Ron, or, or uh, maybe a, a, a other modern theologian to tell us that God took eternity uh, to try to establish. Is that? Yeah, thank sense? you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I, I first really thank you for raising the Trinity. <clears throat> I just have come over the years to find it more and more crucial for my identity as a th Christian theologian. I won't go as far as Beaumont Pannenberg in saying what they say about it, but I, I think it's essential. And the and Ron's rule that the economic is the imminent and vice versa really means to me, as it does to them and Ted Peters and others, <clears throat> uh, that there is an intrinsic relation, and by relation, he means an ontological phenomenon, not just a consequential phenomenon, like I happen to be friends with you know, my students, but intrinsic, like I, I'm Christy's dad. But there's an intrinsic relation between these two. There's only one trinity, but what we, what's manifest to us in saving grace is really the God who is him, hidden and imminent in God's self. Now, that becomes central for him for his, say, his notion of eternity. <clears throat> and here he picks up on an Augustinian thought, which is really important for our conversation. So just, it's a way of talking about how our experience here in creation relates to our experience in new creation. And it's framed in terms of time here and eternity there. And that's framed in terms of God's eternity as an attribute of the divine being, so it's doctrine of God. And the attribute is structured on the notion of the infinite he gets from Hegel, which is true infinity. And true infinity is an infinity which subsumes the finite without overcoming it. So I'm taken up into God and I'm still me. I'm taken up to God eternally. Now, the key on the time and eternity thought is <clears throat> Augustine has this subjective notion of time as well as objective notion. We saw the objective notion. And it gets, um, it, it funds the sciences into thinking that time is a linear phenomenon of point-like events. And that makes calculus the adequate tool for science because calculus is constructed that way. So physics uses calculus, which reinforces Augustine's view that objective time is point-like. But he had a subjective view of time that is much more rich, and he used the word duration for it. So, you know, you remember, well, I remember when Christy was born, as if it were yesterday. Well, that's, it's present to me, right? It's part of my present. I'm vaguely aware of that at the moment, present to me now. Although I'm here now, 44 years later, I'm, just, I'm not crazy. I'm, back there. But that's not what objective time is. That's, that's what he calls subjective time. And I anticipate the dinner we're going to have tonight and the conversation. It hasn't happened yet, but I have inklings about it. And that's part of what you know, influences the, right now. I'm kind of aware of well, what you think you're going to have for dinner. I'm trying to make a simple example of this complex notion. What Pandenberg says, and he kind of hints at it, is that na nature in herself, objective time, may be like subjective time. That is, nature itself may have a kind of time in which the, the past, present, and future are in the present moment. Now, I've written a book on this, so the word I use for it is co-present because I don't want to use the word simultaneous because simultaneous gives you Augustine's timeless eternity. But for Pannenberg, eternity is like the um, pearls on the... On the um, necklace that all reflect each other. Every moment has its past and its future in the moment. What gives them their, their unity? You and I experience the past is gone. But it, we can ask for forgiveness, but we can't undo the past in any literal sense. And we don't know what the future will, come, will, will be. But according to Pannenberg, at least, every moment of our life is taken up literally into the divine eternity. So that my moment now, with this remembering of Christie's birth, anticipating dinner or my death, in this present, is one of an endless sequence of presents, all of whom are taken up and hang together in eternity. They don't coalesce to one event. They retain, they retain their distinctiveness. But they lose their separability. And my image of it is the OpenStax library. You go to a library, and you can take off Every, every book in the library is the story of your life from a different moment of time. You can take all those books together, read it, and in any order, 
and think of yourself in any way. Whereas life here is a closed stack. You can only pick up one book at a time. You can never read a book twice. You can never read a book before the book between. And you can never read it again. So what our experience of time is broken. It's fallen. It's not the way time should be. But our experience right now of eternity is the way time is. is. It's not spatially or temporally separate from us. That's why I couldn't a respond to the question, well, where is the space of the new creation? It's here. W where else could it be? We're in the presence of God. I mean, if we weren't in the presence of God, it wouldn't be. But it's not the way we're going to be in the presence of God. It's broken. I, I mess up. Right? So eternity is the transformation of this world into how it really should be and actually is. And that's, a, that's because of Rana's rule. That's because the eternity of the imminent trinity is the eternity of the present economic trinity, which we experience at mass or in hunting our kid. So it's not some other time or other space, but it's not the way it is now, thank God. It's a trans the new creation is a transformation, not a replacement or a substitute. Right? So we still have lunch. We still have a sandwich, but I get a different